everyone. Uh, we've got Gerald Sung with us. He's a concept artist, designer and art director. And he's agreed to have a chat with us today. He is incredibly talented and we're so excited and thank so you. grateful to have a chat with him. Gerald, thank you so much for being with us here today. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, first off, tell us what you do and what is a concept artist? I know that there's just so many branches under art and design, but specifically share with us, what exactly do you do on a daily basis? What is a concept artist? Um, official job role of a concept artist is that we help visualize a director or a client's vision. So what would happen is um, a script, if it's a film, then it'll be a script. If it's a game, there will be a game document. Mm -hmm. And it's a series of words, references, analogies about how the thing should look like. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously there's no picture yet. So a concept artist is a trained illustrator or drawer or an artist that will use, utilize their skills in painting to create the picture that is supposed to mimic what you see on screen in the end. Right. Yeah. So essentially it's a uh, pre-visualization pre of what the final product would be. Right, okay, so you help the client or uh, clients mm. or students or whoever that uh, comes to you um, for the idea to be conceptualized and you do the work mm. and after that you commercialize and sell it. Correct. Um, and there's a stronger focus, so the, the word even concept art is, I mean, it's a relatively new one. People have been doing it for forever, right? Um, I, I bet like even the caveman wheel, someone had to sketch <laughs> it out. And essentially, that's a concept art because okay. it's, the concept means it's, a, it's an idea in your head. Um, it's, a, it's a thought. And the art part is the visualization. So the, the value, the real value of concept is not just um, blindly listening to what the instructions are. Mm but to visualize it in a way that would either be, that would add value in the end. So is there a particular routine that you follow, um, sort of visualizing art that comes to your mind and then putting pen to paper? Mm. Yeah, do you follow a certain kind of structure? Yeah, yeah, there is, a, there is fixed structures, of course. I mean, I even teach the structures in, in the one academy, the school I graduated in. Um, but, uh, like like any work process, there's like a, a pipeline, as we call mm. it in the business, that, that kind of goes from step A to Z. Mm -hmm. um, but my personal one that I've developed over time was um, a stronger Q&A with the client I found is actually the best first step. Um, especially working with directors, it, it, they're trying to tell a story mm -hmm. um, and they're trying to reach an audience and more importantly, they're trying to evoke a feeling. Mm -hmm. So I need to quiz them and ask them, like, what is exactly that feeling mm -hmm. that they want to project on the screen? And I'll need to look into my skill set and the visual, visual language that will help express that. So I think my, my new workflow involves a lot of just talking to them, mm -hmm. communicating with them, figuring out what they want. And this even applies to the most uh, the most unexpected thing because even like let's say you have to design a cup mm. but but if the cup is meant to be in a very intimidating scene it, you would want to design that cup in a way that it would still reflect that message because if you have like a little hello kitty one mm. you know, like a pink color hello kitty club um it, it will kill the mood right so it's like, yeah so i think the original concept obviously is like started of a set design mm -hmm fashion design, um, lighting. Um, and so a, a concept artist kind of has to take all of this contents into play mm -hmm. as part of their repertoire to put it in. Okay. Yeah. So this particular craft mm. of yours, um, have you always been drawing, always been designing from a very young age? Um, were you doodling in class? Mm. Or was there someone in particular in your life that actually inspired you? How did you get started? Yeah, uh, actually, my mom was a very good art student. Uh, she she always tells me that. Like, <laughs> so it runs in the genes. She's self it? self proclaimed. <laughs> <laughs> so it runs in the family then. Uh, I I well it has to be. Um, it's like a it's a curse. Um, or a blessing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like most. Yeah, um, yeah. I believe more. I look into it. Yeah, I I do think it came from her side. Um, my my dad's family is 
heavily fixed into the business end of things. They run companies and, and so on. Oh, that, can, that makes sense now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come to you, think about yeah, you it. Yeah, have the creative side. And <laughs> yeah, look, yeah. you have the business yeah, side yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, I got a watered down version of <laughs> what they have. Um, but I, I was very shy. Um, so having a piece of paper to not talk to a person is a very good thing. Um, I liked, I was very slow learner as well when it comes to words. So I think the pictures were very attractive. Okay. Yeah, so I, I definitely started drawing a lot of things very early on. And, um, you know, I was very close to my mom. So I was like the youngest, so I'm like the, the, the baby. <laughs> um, so I think it was, it was a, what do you call it, like a perfect storm where I had a little bit of my mom's genes. Um, I was young enough to, to not have any requirement to be a good student <laughs> and I was pampered enough that uh, you dodge it, a bullet eh? yeah exactly yeah because uh, my older brother and sister they, they got proper jobs um, uh, my, my sister is very good at sales very good at marketing she's a natural people person uh, she picks up languages fast and naturally she's helping my, my father with that my brother is very analytical. Um, he, he studied management and IT. Mm -hmm. So he was the one that, that, like first in the family to figure out the internet connection kind of mm. stuff. Yeah, very useful at the time. Yeah. Um, still the person I call to if I have IP problems or whatever. <laughs> I have no idea how it works. Um, so, and, and you know, he went to university proper and everything. And, uh, and they're much older than me. Mm. My brother is seven years older. My sister is... I, I think it's nine. Uh, she likes to think it's less than nine. Um, uh, but so I, I think I did not have any expectations on where I should go. Okay. Right. And my parents do well now. Um, so when I said that, you know, when I was 17 after SBM, I, I did get good grades though. Um, it was straight A's except EST ironically. EST is uh, English for English. science and technology. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, as a permanent. Um, so you, you were an mm. art student or a science? Science student. student. Science student. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Same. Yeah, I, I like the because because I grew up in Shah Alam. Um, my parents moved there when we weren't doing so well financially, and I think it was a cheaper opportunity, cheaper place to to set up shop, okay. so to say. Um. The not to throw shade on Shah Alam, but the art school classroom, the art class didn't look like it had discipline or a decent future. So I was like, mm, maybe not. Yeah. Okay. So it seems like the the science classes were a little bit more organized, and everyone seemed less rowdy. So I was like, okay, I'll I'll go mm -hmm. here. And studying is nice. I like studying. Yeah. Um, I thought it was fun. It was a simple arrangement the teacher would give you a task you do the task and then you get a praise it seemed like a simple recipe mm -hmm. to me so i just went along with that mm. yeah the, the art classes i mean i i don't consider what i did at the time art anyway mm. i was just being me i guess mm. and so i like to make pictures using tools right um so i didn't feel the need to learn something that I would just do naturally anyway. Mm. But at 16 and yeah. 17, did you know that that's something that you want to pursue no. as a career? No. No, no that, you... that word didn't mean anything to me. No. Yeah. Okay. But what do you have in mind? Like, do you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be an mm. accountant. Do you have anything, a profession in mind at that time? Well, when I was very young, I, I watched a lot of Discovery Channel and Nat Geo. Uh, we had this thing called Metro TV, mm. and then later became Astro. Good times, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can't this is uh, <laughs> like pre anything. Um, and I love the idea of being an inventor. Uh, mm. I, I remember growing up, uh, like any toys that were given to me, I would. I'll zone in onto the electronic mm. ones with lights or motors because I'll take it apart. Okay. And I'll rewire them and they mm. do weird, weird stuff. Um, because I like the idea of taking parts and making mm. it into a new thing. So 
So that was pretty cool. Um, so when I went into school, I mean, there's the usual thing where people feed you certain expectations like, oh, you can draw and you're not a delinquent. I'll be an architect. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like very limited uh, scope when okay. it comes to expectations at the time. Um, but I was like, oh, I'm not really fascinated by structures, mm-hmm. um, at least not to a degree in the, the professionalism of an architect. Um, so I went to an education fair, like any young uh, SPM, post SPM kid. It was a Mid Valley education fair. I went alone. I think I, I think I think I did my mom drop me off or something like that, mm-hmm. um, and then started to look around. Um, I was wondering whether was there any. Actually, I didn't have a plan to be honest. Mm-hmm. Like so much of my life is not planned. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I think I was honest enough that the the stars seemed to be kind <laughs> to me. <laughs> um, so I went to the fair and lo and behold, there was this booth. Mm-hmm. It was bright orange. I, I remember it like, I, I now that I look at it back, the marketing person behind it is like a genius because it definitely appealed to visual driven okay. students. Um, so it was bright orange, big bold text. Like uh, you could read it from, from across the hall. And there were pictures of these robots everywhere. Mm. Like clearly not drawn, they're like done by something else and I found that was a computer generated image a CGI image mm. so it was done in a computer by a digital artist and I asked them like oh, what's this like mm. this is really cool and they say oh like welcome to the One Academy mm. All right this is a school where you learn this new thing called digital art mm. you don't you don't draw with pens or pencils anymore we use a computer and everything and I was like wow like so robots right like I just do robots every day <laughs> so I was like yeah sign me up um, so I was like, that's what I did. Uh, my, my dad was a little bit bummed out. Um, I think he wanted me to go overseas. Okay. Um, my parents didn't get formal education. Okay. Yeah. So they, they, they are the ones that instill a very, very strong working ethic. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my dad's family runs manufacturing. Okay. So, so they have a factory. Yeah. They have okay. a factory and it's a family run business. And the one thing about manufacturing is that it never stops. Mm. Like every single second, something is to come out mm. and, and you count the performance by the second and by the cent mm. because you're multiplying by hundreds of thousands. Um, so for him, he, he worked his, his butt off and he was hoping that all the kids would get proper jobs, so to say, <laughs> uh, but ironically, the, um, Oldest son and oldest daughter helps him out, and then youngest son is doing whatever this is supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. It's but... a business. <laughs> it's a creative business. <laughs> but but yeah, so I I did that. Um, I told them, you know, it's, a, it's an art school. It looks pretty fun. You know, it's quite yeah. expensive. I don't know. Like actually, I didn't even know what's the what's the value of school at the time. Okay. Yeah, I'm not really bright to be honest. Like um, as in. You know, like I said, like I, I'm just honest. Like I like this, so can I do this? I like mm-hmm. that. Can I try that? Um, and I'm very. I understand as I grow older now. When I talk to different students who have part-time jobs when mm-hmm. they're growing up, who have to take PTPN loans mm-hmm. to study, it's a totally different thing in their head, mm-hmm. right? But but in my entire life, I had the luxury of just focusing on what I enjoyed, mm-hmm. which was drawing and creating pictures. So, so because of that, I mean, regardless, I think my, my parents knew that even if they gave a counter argument about what was the future about, about your cost of living, blah, blah, like it just went through my head anyway. Right. <laughs> so they're like, I think what they did, I'm pretty sure they had a bedroom talk, you know, like, <laughs> like parents do like, hmm. So yeah. it was generally an easy conversation then for you with your parents telling them that you wanted to do this? Yeah, I would say it's not a surprise. Okay. Yeah, it's like, uh, right. I, like, you would have to be so ignorant to not have known that that was going to come. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think their strategy was like, okay, got to build up a savings for Gerald because he's going to screw up <laughs> and then we got to pay for the screw up <laughs> later Aww. when he's jobless. But, but I mean, obviously it's been fine. The career has been moving on okay. Yeah. So they're like, oh, okay, not too bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which is like the, the true blue Asian parents, like, are right, gonna let you try. And then we're gonna keep a safety net for you if like you, you screw up. So very, very nice in that sense. Yeah. yeah. 
but you've done very well for yourself. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your background. How do you get started in the business um, of a concept artist? How has it been like? Was it difficult getting a job at first after you graduated? What was your first job? Mm. And then, you know, what do you do? And how did this come into being? Yeah. yeah. School was incredibly fun. Like incredibly fun. Because you were doing what you loved. Yeah. yeah, and I, for the first time in my youth, I was surrounded by people who shared exactly what I wanted. Mm. And I was rewarded for doing what I liked. So it was a very good place. Like I couldn't recommend more the experience I had at the One Academy. Mm-hmm. So during my third year, um, and I, was, I think I was considered like a, a fair, fairly good student. Um, I had like a 4.0. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was, I was like, hmm, this. I was like, oh, how come it's not ten? <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> I didn't even know what it meant. Like, I was like, oh, why is it such a High weird achiever? What a weird calculation system. Like only up to four. Like. <laughs> so you were top of your class then. Mm, I was um, wow. the dean's dean's list. Nice. Um, what do you call it? Is it called dean's list? Right. Dean's yeah. List, yeah. Me and uh, two other two other uh, graduates uh, and they're both doing very well uh, I need to plug them so um, one is uh, Bram Lee Ching Hong mm-hmm. he runs a YouTube channel very successful one now okay. doing 2D animation uh, another one is Peng Yi Wei and he runs Kurechi Studios which is a gaming company that has done a lot of mobile games and uh, casual games that has won numerous awards he's doing very very well um, you could say he is the um, what do you call it? The forefront at, at strong mobile gaming in Malaysia, casual gaming in Malaysia. I shouldn't say mobile; it's casual now. Yeah. Okay. What's the yeah. difference between mobile and casual? Well, uh, mobile. At one point, most of the casual games were mobile. Okay. But I think it's it's a wrong assessment, uh, and I've made that mistake many times. Casual game just means like any almost anyone can pick it up and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why it's a it's a casual, and it's actually the the largest gaming market. Is casual, okay. right? Um, console or, or the other, we call it almost like dedicated gaming, mm-hmm. or where people buy a, a good TV, a, a good right. computer okay. for it. Yeah. So, um, but these days it's no longer. You have even people just putting it like a web game instead. So the term mobile, I guess, is a little bit off. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, those two. So I was I was one of them, um, and during my third year, uh, because uh, the course is three years. Uh, and then the third year, you wrap it up with the final project, which is an animated short film. Um, and what the One Academy likes to do is they like to bring in industry people to teach. So one of the industry person who taught my class was uh, this person, Wong Cheng Fei. And Fei was uh, my teacher and then later became my first boss, essentially. Yeah, he, he scouted me and my friend Carson and my other friend Ming Wan, and then we all started working at his company called Igloo Digital Arts. Okay, yeah. so that was your first job. Yes, your first employment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So again, it was very fortunate because I didn't even have to ship out a resume or whatever. I didn't have to go knocking oh, on doors. So lucky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that's why it was a uh, it was a very good time. Mm. Yeah. Um, I I the only thing I would say is I got it too easy. You must have come really highly recommended from one academy then for him to just well he thought in. there and i i maybe he saw something mm-hmm. you yeah. know um i mean that's what a, a good ceo should do is mm-hmm. is essentially talent picking mm-hmm. um i remember the interview was a joke honestly because um I, sh- I i made this very you know i consider it quite beautiful demo reels a video with three models turning around mm-hmm. but it's it's terrible uh. i mean like <laughs> 3D is such a refined craft that you, you even though you could do it, it's not exact. It's like singing karaoke. There's like singers and there's karaoke singers. Yeah, so but I was very proud of it. And then you could see in his face, it's like, mm, not impressed. Um, but he's trying to be nice. So he said, like, do you have a, a sketchbook or something? I see you sketching in class and I like your drawings. And I was like, oh, yeah, like because I carry it around. A little one, moleskin or whatever. And I had a big A4 one. I showed it to him. 
because I knew I was like, man, I'm losing this. I'm losing this. I gotta like up my game. So he flipped through it. Uh, he seemed to really like it, and he said that, hey, I think you should be a concert artist. Okay. Um, in my head, I was like, what's that? <laughs> but it's like I was like, yes. I would like to be a concert artist. In fact, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> so he was the first one that planted that. Yeah, you could say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, planted yeah. that seed yeah. of I, being a concept artist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I really owe my career to him actually, because okay. he's the. I mean, he's a pioneer in the business as well. He he came from, well, at the time it's called Tatsun Studio. Okay. Um, Tatsun is the owner of the One Academy, and he was a working artist at one point doing advertising illustrations. Tatsun formed Tatsun Studio. A lot of the what you call generation one business owners, mm-hmm. Lemon Sky, uh, Streamline, all that places, or to some degree are, sorry, it's Lemon Sky and it's King Sun Studio, and I think Passion Republic, they all kind of have a little bit of some kind mm-hmm. of DNA around the One Academy. Okay. So I think I will be considered generation four or three in terms of business owners. Okay, yeah. and we're on to generation what right now? Uh, I think I'm the, the, the youngest one. You're the youngest one. Yeah, for okay. this field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think so, if my market research is correct. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're pretty young, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, so... Uh, kind of like that That happened. Yeah, and then he, he told me that um, you should do designs because I think you're, you're, you are more suited to design. Mm. And I was like... Because in, in my head... All I wanted was a job. Mm. My my dad did ask me, "Hey, you, you got a diploma. Your your grades are not bad. You should go for the studies, mm. right? You should go overseas." And I was like, "But you paid so much money for the school." Mm. I mean, other kids would be jumping at the idea of, "Yes, Dad, I want to go overseas." Yeah. But what what kind of stopped you? Are you a very very family oriented person? That's why. No, I I was just very because I was like I was doing the math. Mm. I was like. Because I'll, I'll help my parents bring the check over to the finance department. Mm. And I was like, there were numbers I've never seen before in my mm. life, right? Mm. 12,000, 15,000, mm. like, you know, every, every semester or so, and it will keep going up. Mm. And it was the first time I was conscious about, like, I'm not sure I can make that amount of money, mm. you know, like, make that, that many back. zeros. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... I was just looking around, like pricing, salary, all that mm. kind of stuff. I was like, oh, this doesn't really make sense. So I knew after I came out from the one academy, I was like, I just told myself, like, I'm going to make make back that whatever money my dad paid into the school. Um, mm. I mean, I didn't give it to him. <laughs> 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 he wouldn't take it as well, I'm sure. Like, we, we have, like, it's a mix of filial piety and father's pride. Like, it's just a clash of, like, you know, sharpest knife and the hardest shield, yeah. So, but I, it was just like a drive. Like, I had a very simple goal, which was um, make back the money, mm-hmm. roughly speaking, you know, that I own 90,000 odd ringgit that mm-hmm. was spent in school. Um, and I had a goal of, like, doubling my salary every year. Wow, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So at least you had that goal in mind, that plan to do it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is strange because uh, my motivations were, of course, like, um, it, it's not like I'll jump into a company and say, like, how much are you going to pay me, that kind of mm. thing. It's more like, um, again, this was like just me being very fortunate in the sense that um, when I worked exceptionally hard or when I focused to provide value, people would give me quite a good amount of money for it. Mm. And I would just repeat that cycle to any person that I could think I could add value to. Mm. So after working for about a year, I, I wanted to resign. Mm. Um, but my, 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 boss, my boss at the time, he said like, you know, you're like, what, 20-ish? Um, why do you want to quit? And I told him, like, I don't see the need to be in the office every day. Mm. Um, I want to go out and talk to people. I want to go out and I I call, I use the word make mistakes. Mm. Um, but but he said that you know if if you want to go out and do some stupid things that you want to do whatever you want to do business wise or whatever, how about you work three days a week? Mm. Um, we'll do a de- salary deduction based on we change like your contract into a, what we call like a contractor based deal 
fixed amount, fixed time. You just come in, do the work, you go. And I thought that was really good. I was like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize how valuable it was because when I talked to other people, like, Faye let you do that. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I don't know. Like, <laughs> it's like, then I was like, so I, that's how I started to, so now I have two days off to explore opportunities. I started doing a lot of things like, um, focus on my personal work. I started like, um, going back to the one academy, talking to them like, Hey, you know, like, uh, sculpture is cool. Do you want to do like workshops or anything like that? And then the school was very welcoming. It's like, Oh, you're back. Okay. Come and share, come and share. Oh, so by that time you already started not only doing mm. digital art, but mm. also started sculpting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been sculpting since I've been drawing since I can remember. I started sculpting since I was like around 15, 16. Oh. Um, so these are one of your sculptures the my sculptures are over here this is the closest one i can reach out nice yeah this what i don't know what year paul came out in um what is his name paul paul yeah it was an old film yeah um i think it was uh seth something okay something yeah and it was a it was a film a hollywood film and it had this very obnoxious uh, gray alien as we call it and um I used to do stuff like this. So cool. Nice. <laughs> so how long did you do this three days a week at Iglu and two days a week just honing your personal craft? How long did you do that for? For another year or two before? That's a good on? question. Yeah. yeah, I never counted. Oh, you were having so much fun until yeah. it just became yeah, blurry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I realized I, I, I bypass a lot of the what do you call it? Trial by fire. Okay. You know, that people go through. Mm -hmm. I was just, I, I was a good mix of ambitious and ignorant. Okay. You know, and, and. Sometimes that's not a bad combination. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As I found out, yeah. yeah. Luckily, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the chances of you getting hurt or, or financially screwed <laughs> is, is like exponentially higher as you get older. <laughs> but, but yeah, fortunately when you're young, um, and like I said, when, when, when my family is it's stable, mm. you know. Again, I, I owe it to the stability of my family or the stability of the parents or the perceived stability that they projected to me. So mm. who knows what really goes on. Yeah. You know, you yeah. strike me as a very... <coughs> you, you have a, a sense of gratitude. A sense of right. gratitude that you exude, you know. Like you're very grateful for the opportunities that you were given. You were, you're grateful to your family. And you don't find that many people that has that sense of gratitude. Yeah. Um, Do you? Really? Yeah. I, I don't yeah. know. I, I mean, I, I work with a lot of younger people now. Um, I, I would say like they are really grat they're really grateful, but they're, they do it in a way that they defeat themselves. Mm. And that's, just, that's quite sad. Yeah. Uh, because they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't try this because I'll make my parents upset. And it's technically, they're still being very grateful and really good mm -hmm. kids. But So that's why I said that's the ignorant part mm -hmm. that I, I'm lucky to have. Mm -hmm. Because I, I thought I was doing the right thing. And it, you know, to, to some maybe more conservative parents, they may be like, oh, that's so bad of you to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you should listen to what your dad said. You know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I was like, no, no. <laughs> like, I Trust me, it's gonna work out. Like, it's like, so I don't know why. Um, yeah, I don't know why. I I think um, again, like, as I grew older, I realized that so many things happens by chance mm. and by f sheer accident. Um, that to to say that you had a part in it based on your merits or your skill is a little bit overreaching. Um, so I've just decided not to. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so after Igloo, or when you were in Igloo and then moving on to your next company, which was, mm. um, was it Lemon, Lemon Sky? Sky. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I and spent were, a lot of time there. Yeah. Seven years, was it? Uh, well, accumulated because the, the owner was the same person. Right, so, okay, so your boss from Igloo yeah, yeah. brought you over to Lemon Sky. Yeah, okay. so what happened was uh, Igloo uh, was a gaming company and then I worked on a lot of fun things like Splatterhouse, PS3, Sonic, Sega Racing. It was like all like big titles. I was in the time of my life. Mm. 
um, even though we were like drawing rocks and plants, <laughs> like, but it was like so cool. <laughs> um, so what what my my genius of a boss wanted to do is he wanted to venture into animation because mm -hmm. at the time Malaysia was uh, ramping up, you know. TV animation, okay. kids animation, these are all like the new emerging markets that Malaysia was poised to take in. Yeah. And that and was about six, seven years ago. Yes. Was the hype, right? Yeah, I think this was 20, you could say 2013, okay. I assume 12, maybe even earlier. I'm pretty sure some people jumped in earlier. Okay. Um, but like I said, you know, pre, like those that, that year of the early 20s, it was a bit of a blur because I was just doing stuff. You were just having fun, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Doing yeah. what you love. Uh, I, I wouldn't dare say that I had any inkling about the bigger picture. Mm. Um, so, MDEC was also, which is the the Malaysian government body, mm -hmm. they were putting so much fun, so much initiative to bolster the animation and just generally all the multimedia scenes through yeah. grants and, and tax a lot incentives. Of accelerator programs there. Yes, yeah. yes, Incubator very, very good. Programs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the, the support in general was very, very obvious mm. it, it was it cut through a lot of red tape even i noticed so my my boss was smart enough to really want to know that that's where the future is so um re, re, re form a new company with all the same core team and i was one of them we called it lemon sky games and animation like i was literally there when we were looking at the logo options and everything it was, a, it was a very kind of the pioneer team. <laughs> pioneer team. Pioneer. Well, yeah, we, we were just like a another brain on the table, I assume, for for his picking. Mm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then, then that became Lemon Sky, and uh, so because my story, I was a, uh, technically a three D artist. I, I would even do very small, relative models, three D models for the video games. Work my way up to become junior concept artist, to senior concept artist, to concept art lead, to art director. Hmm and under the same roof um, and so I was very familiar with the, the, the environment of the company I was very familiar like the, 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 the bosses Ken Fong and Fai would you know we would talk almost constantly about mm. how to make the company better how to improve the team how do we push ourselves as a, as a studio what, what image do we want to make uh, what are we trying to create so it was like a really good what do you call it? Like an MBA, right? Like a, a business... Is that what you call it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, management Business Administration. Masters of Business Administration. Yeah. yeah. It was like a free MBA, yeah. right? Because I was in their head a lot. Mm. And, and, and they would talk to me about... That's why I say I owe my career to them. Mm. They would talk to me about how they, where the industry is going, what you should do as a team leader, mm. uh, what am I doing right, what am I doing wrong. Right. And, and I would just do it mm. yeah and and it was um it was great like the the company went from 20 less than 20 odd people in Klanajaya, mm. not too far off from this i think it was mm. about the twice the size of this mm. um wet carpet nerdy boys you know pc is always running the background to now it's like a, i heard last i checked it's 300 people the wow. company, yeah. And yeah. it's still in Kalanajaya. No, they shifted to Aradamansara, got like a swanky corporate building, you know, nice. like uh, you got like, there's a guard at the door. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, like I'm, I'm very much like, I don't know, what's the English word for Jakun, but that's like who I am. I'm a kid from Sha Alam. Like, uh, to me, it's like, wow, you can do pictures in the computer. Mm. Yeah, it's most of the time it's like that. I mean, now, now I'm venturing into like, all kinds of newer technologies but I think at the heart it's still the, the same mentality I guess mm -hmm. but yeah these, these people were the ones that really showed me the um, and they gave me a really good taste that what it's like to be in the very big and well oiled engine mm -hmm. of a company mm -hmm. and I was essentially hooked I, I was like they tried to be their best soldier mm -hmm. right and my, my team grew up to 25 people mm. at max and they had one branch in Penang even that I would look after and I would you know as an art director I essentially oversee all of the visual arts mm. make sure the target is on point make sure the clients are satisfied make sure all the the artists have a track record of learning and improving mm. that way they are getting better as a mm. person and so as a professional basically managing teams and yes. teams of people yep. in KL and in Penang yeah, yeah. um 
we had a very good uh, team of producers to to work together with. Um, so it was a like a very well thought of business structure. Mm. Um, and my management was art management, so mm. to say, where it's the visual quality of what the company is trying to hit. Mm. So my my sensibilities arched over even the three D and other productions, animation productions. Mm game productions because it's just another good set of eyes to voice out like that part's off this part is not falling what we, we needed and I even directed some animation shorts I directed some cinematics I, I directed a couple of like in-house projects um, again it was yeah the, the best training you can ask yeah, for you were busy mm, mm. yeah the hours were pretty crazy um, I, I lived and breathed in the office uh, happily mm. yeah um, I remember my first year was, was 10 to 11, 10 to 11, 10 to 11 p.m. Um, and all, all I could think about was like, what well, I wanted to do the next day at work. Mm. Um, you're not good for relationships, uh, I realized. Mm. Like, <laughs> but how do you balance that? Work you and don't. Like, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> like, you find a person that can take it. Yeah, yeah. literally. Yeah. I, I've learned that the hard way. I mean, my. I had a long-term relationship, close to 10 years, that, that failed at, at a very uh, pivotal point in my life. But I mean, I've, I've since found someone new, but mm. what I learned was that um, you just got to like roll with the punches. There's literally nothing you can do right. about it. Yeah. If there is a loss, then there's just a loss. Like, mm -hmm. If there's a gain, then just take the gain. Right. Yeah. If to, to expect or to alter will be a monstrosity on either way. Okay. Yeah. So because you wouldn't be happy with that regardless yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and it's a is a gain that is not worth the price mm -hmm. yeah so i found out that it wasn't like what makes you happier is like which pain do you are worth you do you don't mind living with mm -hmm. yeah so just choose the lesser pain wow. yeah mm -hmm. then regardless you, you can just um work your way through it mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of like sports mm -hmm. yeah every every sports is is so painful to your body but you, you just kind of choose the ones that you can manage but yeah. Okay. Mm. Deep words. Mm. Yeah, wise yeah. words. No, because <laughs> I'm I'm so big on like the psychology books and and talks these days. And what's your favorite? Uh well, what Simon Sinek is a very good one. Oh, Simon Sinek. He had this um mm. his YouTube video about millennials went viral. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, mm. Very charismatic speaker. Um, but I, my my favorite thing from it was actually the the business talks that he okay. would give, starting with why. Um, I I thought was very useful. I I listened to a lot of um, Jordan Peterson as well, um, clinic clinical psychologist based in Canada, and and he talks a lot about self responsibility, um, um, developing a mindset that is based on responsibility mm -hmm. and maturity, and I really like that. Went through a couple of books of uh, man, so I have tons like audiobooks, uh, books in general. Okay. Yeah, but they they were very helpful because I, I, I realized I I couldn't find a mentor. Uh, like like there was a saying right like you, if when the when the time comes when you need a mentor, mm. the mentor will come. So you don't search for a mentor; the mentor will come to you. In the meantime. I, I knew maybe I figured like I was, that my time wasn't ready so I turned to books and audiobooks instead because I was in severe need of mentorship and when yeah. was that? I think over the past three years okay. I believe yeah that this, was when you decided yeah, to exactly. start your own yeah well, your well own that's venture. when I decided to, to quit yeah okay. because I, I left essentially a seven year relationship in the company mm. I was considered the you know what do you call it like upper middle upper management at mm. that point like a parking spot, you know, people say, oh, Gerald, hey, you know, <laughs> like when I walk in, the producers will come, oh, you got to check this and check that. Okay. Well, I was like, like, you know, big shot, right? Um, so why do you decide it? Why, why do you decide to leave then? Yeah, because uh, I was, uh, well, number one, I was starting to believe that I was a big shot, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. which is very dangerous. Um, there is, there is a lovely... A, like quote or what do you call it like uh, anecdote from Simon Sinek I'm just okay. gonna use his words because his words are better than mine um, he was talking about like a, a person who 
at one point of his career, when he went out to give speeches, they would fly him out first class. When he went to the hotel, hotel already, someone would be there, checked in, his oh, bags already there. Yes, yeah. yeah, you know which yeah, one, right? Yeah, I know which one, yeah. And it's a coffee cup story. So when he went to the, the place to get a coffee, it would be given to him in a very nice porcelain cup. Mm -hmm. And then the next time he comes over to give a speech, he had to fly by coach, buy his own money, mm -hmm. check into his own hotel. And when he went to the place and asked for a coffee, the person just pointed this over there by the machine. Mm -hmm. And what he got was a little styrofoam cup. And what he learned was that, like, that, that cup, the, the good cup and the styrofoam cup was, you always deserve the styrofoam cup. Mm -hmm. The good porcelain cup was meant for your position. Not at you. The, yeah, not you. Mm. So I realized that I was taking a lot of things and believing that what I got from position was because of me. Mm. And I was very worried that how it would affect a lot of mm. other things. Um, I, I wasn't as, you know, I'm, I'm saying it now in a way that looking back, mm. it was quite clear what was going on. But I was a hot mess like, at the time, so, yeah. so I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know, really yeah. know how to, to kind of put pieces together. In terms of the balance between your personal and professional life, or uh, was it how it was all getting I, to you I don't all know. at once? Yeah, it was just like, like uh, or red flags like, or whatever, yeah. you know, like, like you know something's not right. And I think uh, the human brain is, is capable of reading this if you allow yourself enough time to look deep into it. Mm. Um, I guess I've always been, that's the benefits of being quiet, is you have no one but yourself to think about sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so I would do reflections and things like that. And, and I was very lucky that I was going out. I still mm -hmm. taught like two days a week, even though I was art director. I would just squeeze it in. So I'll teach in the morning and then go back to the office at, after the class. Okay. And then I'll just cover my hours by working late or whatever. Wow. So I was lucky enough that because I was going out, the, uh, what do you call it, the veil of importance was always fluttering. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> cause I'll be in the classroom and it's a different scenario. I'll, mm -hmm. be, I'll be talking to different managers, different business models and from school. I was doing freelance still. Mm -hmm. I was like importing super sculpy and selling super sculpy oh, clay. You only and... have twenty four hours a day, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because like I, I was, uh, I'm very afraid that, uh, like, because I think um, mortality is real. <laughs> <laughs> so, and but this is, I mean, I grew up watching my dad fly across the country in and out. So I think I was just mm. essentially monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. So you adopted that working yeah, ethic. Yeah. Okay. And my mom was a, she, she did real estate. She was a real estate agent when times were tough. And so I, when I was a kid, I would follow her and she, I would see her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking back, it makes sense. I, mm -hmm. I, I essentially just had many, I, I was um, dumb enough that I just saw what I saw and I remembered it. And I was lucky enough that what I saw was good stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, and it just kind of like all of that mm -hmm. helped to build a, a less f corruptible personality, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Would you say you were working yourself to the ground? No, I wouldn't no? say that. I mean, it, it from the outside, it did look like it, mm -hmm. but um, I, I like. I mean, I like to work hard. Is is the only one thing that you can be certain of. Mm. Um, and I, I don't have. And that's the beauty of it. If your passion and your hobby is your career, uh, there's nothing much left to do, mm. right? Um, so, I wouldn't say it was, yeah, no, mm. not at all. It, it was nice. It was like literally really nice. And more, the most, the best part is like I felt important, which is I think what every young person wants to feel, mm. you know, like whether if it's for the right reasons or not, like being feeling important is crucial. Um, so I felt very important, mm. um, but you know, it makes your head grow big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's when I realized that, okay, something's not right. Yeah. And I think, uh, re failure in the relationship, I think like personal relationship mm. also, I think helped me realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, this is definitely my fault. Yeah. Or my responsibility at, at bare minimum. Mm. Yeah. So it was good. Very, very lucky. Yeah, could have been worse. Mm. Yeah, could have been way worse. Um, 
So you decided to to resign、mm. and start focusing on the same on the same work, but have more time to focus on yourself. Was that it?、Um, it was number one.、Um, yeah, like there's a saying that you don't start to resign right away. You start to resign a year before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if people think about it already, like way early on. They're、yeah. just trying to figure out when's the right time to tell their boss. <laughs>、yeah. Was that the case for you? Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. yeah, and you know it. Like when you don't feel like going to work, that's kind of like the first flag.、Mm. Yeah, because I would like spring out, gotta go work, like、mm. you know, kind、mm. of thing. But after I was like,、mm, coffee break, morning coffee breaks take a bit longer. Lunch、mm. breaks a bit dragging a bit long.、Mm. You kind of know you're you're a little bit disenchanted.、Um, but、uh, so essentially, what happened was like I, the year I realized that.、Um, You know that when I had that styrofoam moment, styrofoam cup moment,、mm. then I realized I I I need to start focusing time on strengthening my cup rather than relying on this beautiful ceramic cup that、mm. Lemon Sky had given to me.、Mm. So I started freelancing at night and on weekends while I maintained my my job、mm. and my classes and whatever. So I, I increased my workload during that period、um, to essentially. Test myself, number one, whether could I do this on my own if I had to. Mainly because there is always a possibility in a full-time employment that you will get fired, or the company will just close.、Mm-hmm. Whether you like it or not, it's a reality. So I was just building the safety nets to ensure that if that would happen, that either I walked or the company fired me, or there was whatever reason the company closed, I would still be secure.、Mm-hmm. And the only way I can think of of being secure was securing skill sets.、Mm. So I started going back to freelancing,、mm. um, started responding to、uh, direct client emails, things like that.、Mm. That started to work out well. I was surprised at how、uh, positive that was.、Mm. And、um, when it came when it came time to resign, it wasn't such a scary experience.、Mm. Yeah, I had the systems in place, so it relatively all right. Obviously, it was a bit like、uh, there was a bit of friction because you know any key person leaving the company is problematic. So I spent a good、uh, six months, I believe. My my, what do you call it? The that period before you leave the company, but after you tell them you're gonna leave.、Um, uh, is your um, okay? Is it ex- yeah, like leaving now, yeah. period, yeah. whatever you call it. I think usually it's like three months or something.、Yeah. I think I I I stayed for six months ish.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then I make sure like my, but even prior to that,、mm-hmm. I was already training my second in commands, that kind、okay. of a thing. To I was already starting to okay, like if you run your team,、mm-hmm. let's say theoretically I'm not here. Here's what you should do. Preparing <laughs> yeah, all your yeah, handover yeah. documents. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, or it was a handover book. <laughs>、uh, it was no. I mean, in Malaysia, you just sit down with a friend. You sit on your team and you talk about it a lot, and then you 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 give them the the mindset. It's documents are the silliest thing. I think、mm. you, you just want mindset. Once your mindset is in the right place, you 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 you'll write documents. I I guarantee that. So, what was important was just to let them know what was the mindset. You know, like you you're not a guy holding a pen. You know, you, you're、mm. you're a person looking after a product. You're a person looking after a vision. Do that instead. Find people who want to help you do that.、Mm. That kind of a jazz.、Um, and I was doing that and、uh, to make sure that okay, if I leave. Company will still make money. The company will still be successful. Because、mm. the worst thing, the the there was a saying that you, you want to leave the company and they get more successful. That's that's the right way to leave, right? So try to do that. And then after I kind of broke the news, it's like a very awkward breakup.、Um, we had a lot of sit downs and talks because they, I love them and I think they loved me as well. Very good company, very good people on board.、Uh, but you know. Even even Fai said like,、uh, yeah, Gerald. I know when you make up your mind, you kind of already make up your mind. So, so I'm not gonna bother to try and stop you this time. Yeah. So, did that.、Uh, set all the pieces in place the best I can. Moved on. Yeah. Then when I woke up the at home with no place to work at, I was like,、hmm, quite nice. Yeah. What was the、bad. transition like? Yeah. Was it、uh, an adjustment that you had to get used to? Or was it something that you already、mm. was preparing for for the last one year, and you were like, "I was, I've been waiting for this moment. I'm just gonna hit the ground running with my freelance business."、Mm. 
No, it's extremely lackluster. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like neither here nor there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was extremely um, uninspiring. Nor was it like as you imagine, like mm. a film. There's an event, uh, but nah, it's mm. really not. Um, and most of reality is like that. Um, but that that period was, I, I would say, it was a tough one because I was going through uh, uh, like my 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 wedding failed so my, my I split up my fiance a few weeks after the wedding um, I my I had cats who I loved and look after and they, they passed away one after the other one from both from illness yeah oh, like tragic illness so sorry yeah. to hear that yeah. oh thanks yeah yeah, yeah. You, I'm surprised how I'm still sad about it yeah mm -hmm. like because um, it's strange I can't imagine when a, your child dies that's, that's must be insane mm -hmm. but Anyway, so all of that happened within a few months after another. And then I was leaving the company that my entire identity is based off. Mm. So that's like a quadruple whammy, I would mm. say, or triple whammy. Mm. Uh, but the beauty of it was, is like when you have zero false identity, you can construct anyone that you want. Mm. And luckily enough, I just decided to, instead of make a fake identity, I just looked inside and figured out who my identity was. And I just focused the time to build that up instead. Mm -hmm. And so that was the period where I really look into, what do I like as an artist? Mm -hmm. Why am I inspired by as an artist? Who do I really look up to? Who are my actual friends and who are people that I'm just acquainted with? What are the goals in my life? And that's when I started to really, you know, suck up all the books suck up all the mentorships mm. uh, any sort of audiobooks I could think of podcast um, to essentially re-educate myself mm. yeah because prior to that I was wearing the Lemon Sky badge or the One Academy badge or whatever mm. so now I need to put my own name mm. and represent myself instead so it was very good mm. very very good but it was tough like very very tough um, um, but in some sense it's the best age to lose everything mm. uh, rather than a little bit later mm. How old were you then? 27, I believe. Mm. Yes, 27. Okay. So, um, it's, a good, it's a good time to have a turning point if you want one. <laughs> yeah. um, I think 35 would be a bit tougher, I would imagine, but that depends on your society. But okay. anyway, so... Um, so what did you discover when you, were, when you were putting on the Gerald Sloan badge? and trying to rediscover your own identity. What do you discover? Mm. Have you discovered him? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that's a very good question. I, I don't think it works that way though. Um, I think it's the, like it's, it's so tacky, but the discovery is the main goal. Um, but what I found out was that whatever someone else regards you as mm. that is not your focus that that is just the outcome you are only entitled to work and to do what you think is right mm. and if if other people reward you for it then gracefully accept it if other people despise you or or, or attack you for it then you just have to learn to deal with it mm. and if someone calls you a successful person that's about it. it doesn't mean anything besides mm -hmm. that if someone calls you a failure it's the same thing it has mm -hmm. no value you can you're only entitled to do what the work and do what you think it's right mm -hmm. so that's why i don't think there's a there's an end product anymore mm -hmm. whereas when i was younger i would always think like okay if i'm 80 it means i'm successful if i have this it means i'm a good right, right. but mm -hmm. that that crumbled apart pretty quickly because that's not how life works mm -hmm. Yeah, your title and whatever things people say of you, good or bad, is literally just that. Mm -hmm. It's just what people say. Yeah. And coming from a social media, I'm, I'm relatively new. I mean, my, my niece and nephew, they're so much younger now. They already have Facebook accounts. I was like, oh my God, you guys, it's so <laughs> soon. Um, but I, I only started at 16, I think, MySpace. Facebook. MySpace. Oh, MySpace. Mm. Friendster, I MySpace. Think it was Friendster. Yeah, 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 okay. That was cool. I really like that era because it, were you on Friendster? I was on Friendster. Um, yeah. You know how that time you write testimonials, testimonials about how good of a yeah. person you are. It's yeah. such a positive time, and then now it's just like oh, run around school asking people to write mm, testimonials. For exactly. Me. Like, hey, I write. I wrote for you. Please write for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I wonder like 
did, I'm pretty sure that has affected our mentality some mm. sort like to speak kindly of other people yeah mm. um, but but social media what we regard to today is, is, a, is like a, a cesspool of critique Mm. <laughs> it's almost like yeah I've never thought about it that yeah. way um, friends there and Facebook but now that you put it that way it makes sense mm-hmm. mm. even the, the name uh, friendster literally means you're looking for friends, friends and Facebook means the visual surface you're projecting mm. it's like this yeah. the irony of it and that's a society that we mm-hmm. have yeah subconsciously built and developed yeah mm. so you know like when you're young and, and I was that person too I would look at who gets more likes and we have artist equivalents of that called art station where it's a, it's a social artist area where you put up works and works that get more attention will be bumped up mm. works that are not considered good will be forgotten things mm-hmm. like that so if if your men, your mental capacity is weak it's it's such a dangerous place to be mm. because you're you're literally influenced by the um fickleness of the marketplace which is very dangerous because you end up being swept away by whatever is the taste at the moment mm. yeah so that was a tough lesson um and when i was looking into i was like you know what screw everything uh, i'm just gonna draw what i like mm. and actually that's when i started my metalhead ip and my metalhead ip is, is a series of designs all connected around skulls and machines which is mm. my two favorite things so it's something like this uh, yeah because this is a this is a well, you know this is from terminator mm-hmm. and it's called the endo skull created mm. by james cameron this is actually a model kit that i painted years back um, because i can't afford the the more expensive variant mm. of this but i'm happy with this one so you've seen terminator by yes. any chance <laughs> yes uh, the, the first one or the ones um. after the ones after okay like, yeah a lot of people regard the ones after as not actual to me okay, so i'm going home and i watch the first one yeah, so this yeah, yeah this, <laughs> so is, this what, is based on the first one. yeah this okay. is based on the first one uh, when arnold was was much younger and okay. couldn't speak english that well yet and um, <laughs> uh, wasn't the governor yet uh but why like because people ask me a lot like dude what, what's up with the skulls um uh because I've been always incorporating it in my work for mm. as long as I can remember. And that's something that I would say is your signature look, wouldn't I I, I guess so. Um, but again, I'm going to leave it for other people to say it. <laughs> yeah, because uh, there's so many good artists that incorporate skulls very well okay. into their design. So mm. it will be wrong for me to take that from them. Um, but all I can say is like the, the, the skull to me is... Uh, I, maybe the way I view it is unique. Um, I've always thought of it as like one of nature's best sculptures Mm. Um, and I will tell my students this story actually like when you fall in love with a person let's say a boy or a girl you find them beautiful gorgeous because their eyes position I mean it's is it really their face or is it their skull (laughs) because your facial features are determined by the shape of your skull Mm. you know the size of your eyes the distance between the eyes Mm. your nostril is all determined by the bone structure mm-hmm. underneath. Then why do we disregard? Do, why do we regard skulls as death or a Halloween ornament mm. when it's the foundation of beauty? And I I I've been seeing that forever, and I mm. can't understand why no one sees that. Mm. Like why is it still? Uh, what's the word when it's biasly regarded as something mm. negative? Because mm. yeah. even when I go to to business meetings, mm. like. People recommend don't put the skull on the yeah, name card or whatever. Bad omen. Yeah, 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 yeah. But and I, I find that so interesting. Mm. Uh, even uh, what do you call it? Psychology-wise, mm. we are afraid of what's inside. Yeah. <laughs> we rather show off the the beautiful rubbery thing that's mm. outside. But this is the real structure. Well, you know, when I see a person, I admire their skull. I admire the the features. You know, I admire the the structure behind it. And I like this mentality a lot because when I see a company, I don't look at the decoration interior. Mm-hmm. I look at the structure of the company. Okay, and the like, fundamentals. Yeah, the fundamentals. Okay. What do they believe in? What's their value? And and a skull is essentially that. It's a, it's a sculpture form 
and, and nature has been trying to tell this to us all this time. So that's why I incorporate it in. And I've always liked machines because I, I love the idea of how we are all machines to a degree. A machine is just a formulation of parts creating something bigger. So it te technically it's everything. Um, and you know, visually it's badass. So yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's like a win-win. Yeah. My, my 12 year old self gets excited when I draw it. So I, I kind of like it. And people say that's important, right? Like to yeah. do something that you are excited of as a kid. I've even like heard your childhood creativity. Um, was brewed mm. during your childhood. Yeah, the, the, I heard this thing from uh, uh, Guillermo del Toro is a film director, mm. right? He did Shape of Water, mm. uh, Pan's Labyrinth. I think he said something along the lines of um, work hard to be a rich 55-year-old so you can be a 5-year-old again. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. So <laughs> clever because it's exactly right. Like you, you, I'm working my butt off to basically build a life that I can be again when I was like 12, mm. you know, yeah. buy the stuff that I like, uh, do the stuff that inspired me mm. as a child. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a, it's a strange bargain, but yeah, mm. it's, it's the world that we have at the moment. So when you were art director, yep. you didn't have the, um, the time and the space to actually do the things that you like. You were having fun, but at the same time, you didn't go back to the creativity part of your childhood. And you found that mm. when you quit and did your freelancing gigs for a bit. And then you started um, coming up with your signature look, machines and skulls. Yep. How long do you do that um, freelance, freelance the, gigs? I see. Mm. Well, the, the full-time freelance meeting, I didn't have a paid salary. It was mm. actually only for a year. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But I was on and off freelancing for my entire career, actually. Ever since I graduated, I would try to do mm. outside work. So it wasn't something foreign to you? No. Something scary? Yeah. It was only, um, uh, well, it, it got pretty scary when I realized I had a house loan and a car loan to pay off. Yeah. Um, that's when I, I think that that was a, a good wake up call mm -hmm. about how money works. <laughs> 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 um, and the fact that uh, you, you have well, like commitments, mm -hmm. as they, they call it, someone or something you have to pay to every month, whether you like it or not. Um, but funny enough, the, the first thing I did was hire someone, which is a new commitment. But I figured that the best way to make more money was to find ways to to uh, duplicate my service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wouldn't say I was freelancing, but I was probably running a business with one employee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I think is different. And that has evolved into... Yeah. Ten Ten Studio. Yeah. So, so what happened with Ten Ten Studio was, um, I was, you know, I was running a, a, a home office mm -hmm. um, in Subang Jaya. It was an apartment that we rented out. I rented it with two other concert artists, mm -hmm. Jeremy Chong, Johnson Thing, um, and I brought one of my ex students in to do work for me. I'll mm -hmm. pay him a, a fixed salary, um, and he will help me out. But I was looking at the size of the condo and I was like, hmm, that's about it. Four people max. And that was already creating tension because you got one toilet, whatever, you know. <laughs> you got like a bunch of like artist divas all having their <laughs> needs. So uh, I was like, okay, I mean, this is, this is my mistake. This is not going to work out. How long was that? How long did you share that space with other people? Exactly one year. Okay. This is that one year. Yeah. So even when I started the freelance, I because I was what I was gonna do I was gonna I told myself I was gonna rent a place because mm. I can't work from home. Okay. <laughs> like for me is that would be too alien of mm. a jump and I need to wake up, do my routine where I shower, put on the, the jacket mm. and then go out. Regardless of where that out is, I mm. need to do that because mm. I can't I, I need to go into the zone. Because for me, doing art and work is two separate entities. I know it overlaps, but mm. but work is about servicing the goal, mm. and and art is about you drawing in a cafe, in a, mm. in, and in my line of work, the art is a tool set, but that's about it. Mm. I, I wouldn't say it's a, it's an encompass. I would most of the time call myself a service provider more than anything, mm. but my tool set and my expertise is encompassing the art industry. Mm. Uh, and that allows a very good partition between your ego and the service they're trying to provide mm. because you, you discount your identity from it. 
Um, and I think that's important because you don't really want to sell yourself so early. Mm. You want to invest in yourself. So the metal head is something that I'm just investing in myself. Mm. If I see opportunities to turn it into a product, then I'll, I'll either put money into it and mm. I'll do it on my own. Um, but yeah, like basically that's it. So it was, it was one year of running that and um, um, I was talking to another friend who is now my business partner. Mm. Uh, his name is Jason. And I found out that he was doing the same thing mm. but for cinematics and basically CGI videos. Mm. So he would do advertisements mm. uh, things like that sometimes like a more high-end content and I was I, I sat down with him and I was like dude I think this is good mm. because you know for me I always believe in multiple streams of income as mm. a business anyway mm. like it's you can't do one so we should join up mm. we will basically double our capital right because we got two person now but also we have like double talent pool double business streams it's so much easier for me to go and talk to other clients hey we have this and we have this rather than just me doing pictures mm. so and I like him as a person mm. I think he's a great guy he he comes from the same hometown as my mom mm. funnily enough um, and and what I found out is like in, in life it's finding people around you that you can mm. trust and believe in it's so rare um, so it's, it's just if you find one just do your best to hold on to it um, so we we thought okay let's let's do it mm. right um, and then basically that was that like mm. shop for a place um, did all the stuff mild renovation mm. um, I already had people waiting because like one of the beauties of teaching in the school mm. is you have not much of a shortage of candidates yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, the, the hiring process is not difficult um, uh, and thankfully I have clients that I service fairly and they seem to come back for mm. more so it kind of uh, rolled from there. Mm. Currently our goal as a company was to I want to discount my name more and more that is the goal. Why is that? Uh, because a company is not me, a company is a company. So if I'm a CEO, I'm a, I'm a company builder, I need to build value in this company and the people who run it. So I, sh I, I need to be able to sell the company as what this company provides mm. as opposed to me as a seven year whatever. Mm. You know, because, um, because then it'll be, a, it'll be an infinite value of a company, mm. which is what true companies are. Mm. Um, like Steve Jobs after he passed away Apple is still Apple because mm. the fundamentals and the values are there mm. right and then um, Tim Cook is leading it fine mm. because the structure is there so when Jeff Bezos leaves Amazon there will be many people to look after mm. and the first step is you have to discount yourself mm. discount yourself as CEO out um, but right now we're still small mm. so obviously when you're small the, 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 the company owners are the company the mm. face the brand yeah. Um, How many people do you have now? On your five, team? Okay. five concept artists. Um, looking at two more. The plan is like by, you know what? Let's not talk about plan. Yeah, mm -hmm. they always change. But the goal is to grow. Okay. Uh, at a reasonable rate, where, um, because the the goal now is to find a good balance between manpower or human power. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> the balance between human power and standards of living. Um, and efficiency very very tough things to balance mm. out um, and I am opening shop in a environment where my competitor is Lemon Sky 300 people Passion Republic has 200 people and they're all way better way more experienced at what they mm. do so um, we as a small company tend to just have to be creative at value propositions essentially yeah and we'll just make the best of the fact that we're the underdog because mm. there's a lot of things that we can do yeah, yeah. Mm. a lot of rules we can break as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but hiring people do you think that there's a strong talent pipeline out there i know you teach at mm. one academy but what are your thoughts on the on the quality of the talent that's out there uh i have a <laughs> you know like my my belief for for talent pool is like um and i tell this to my students 
Oh, welcome to the school. It's a three-year diploma program. This is my class, concept design. Um, don't expect to be professionals after you graduate. Mm. <laughs> because, I mean, you can search for me, but there's nothing in this world that you can master in three years. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's no such thing. So you might as well just drop that mindset altogether. It'll make your life much better and honestly make you more successful. Mm. Um, so I think that will be the only, the only hiccup mm. is to not get caught up with the so to say marketing aspect of any company mm. right um, but yeah the, the pipeline is there um, it's a, like it's a perfect storm you have a government that's very keen on boosting the, this particular part of the mm. industry you have many companies that are very aggressively pushing it as well to make a mark in the, the global industry and you have a global market that is shifting towards Asia Right. Yeah. So it's a very good series of overlaps. Mm. Um, that being said, there's obviously a lot of tribulations in terms of overcompetition, price war, mm. um, as well as management expectations. Right. Because what is good art mm. in that sense? Right. So uh, you've got to have the supply, and you've also got to have the demand there. Um, yes, uh, but but you are now supplying a a fictional product mm. you know and uh, the, the demand itself is also for a fictional product mm. Th- there is no like it's not a commerce product mm. it's not a, a piece of coffee bean that there are grades to it mm. and there's a body to validate the quality of the grade of a coffee mm. bean that you can price accordingly mm. we are talking about a uh, an imaginary service technically yeah. you know because it's a value like how do you say a picture can add value to your film mm. well, you can't mm. really it's almost at the point where it's an instinct from the director and the instinct from the creative heads that realize that yes we need to hire a very expensive art bunch of artists mm. to add visual value to our product and luckily with the track record of marvel films you know the marvel universe disney's marvel they have an excellent art department mm. and they publish books for every film that they produce. Mm. Right. And I bought all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, because the goal is to try and understand where does a value sit. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, someone used the analogy of, uh, because the many companies have failed or, or gone bankrupt because of this. Because normally you think of service business as let's say a a wedding cake company, Mm, right? Your wedding's coming up and then you call a wedding cake company to make a cake. You talk about it, you discuss, you use manpower to meet things, get a person to design the cake Mm. and then you send the cake over, Mm. right? But now they say like, oh, I've seen the cake, I've tried the cake, I don't like the cake, Mm. send me a new one. Mm. Send me a new cake until I'm happy with the cake Mm. and then I'll pay you. Mm. Essentially, this is what the entertainment business is like okay. yeah when we send drawings over it's like a wedding cake it's our best interpretation of what your wedding needs mm. but they have the right to say like we don't like this mm. you have to send a new one so my, me as a company i need to spend that extra amount of time on my cost mm. to reproduce the artwork again right yeah so that's why what i found out what is crucial is communication mm. like setting up goals early understanding the needs of the person early to the point where they trust you and they believe in you because mm. you've spent so much time trying to understand their needs. Mm. Usually by that time when you send something over, it's that reality show moment, like yeah. I was crying. <laughs> like, the cake's gorgeous. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but, but That's the ideal situation. Yes, right? yeah, yeah. But when you talk about 500 people, yeah. you got six directors running the show, it, yeah. it can get very, very messy. Right, so There's that so many is, layers to break through. Mm, yep. It's exactly like advertising, I mm. suppose. Yeah. Yeah. So any of this is, is just the, the, the value proposition is strange. Mm. Right? What do you think the talent pool needs right now, um, apart from talent, yeah. in order to survive in this industry? Because you've been in this, in this industry for a very long time. It must be quite different from when you first started out and how it has evolved. So yes. how, how different it is right now and how do you think the talent should be molded in a certain way to fit into this landscape? That's a very good question. 
my answers have changed over the, the time. Um, it used to be a, a, a skill strategy. Increase your skill, increase the percentage of success. But now there's a skill overload, right? Because everyone's theoretically skilled. Um, so what I'm looking at now is, is a, a mindset. Mm. Mindset and grit. Grit in the sense that you know, you're, you're entering a market that there's 50 or 100 other people applying for the same job. And you're reaching a point where the skill has become saturated. Mm. That it's hard to tell from the quality of one picture to another picture. Mm. right? Because they're all good, they're all colorful, they all have high fidelity. So you have oversaturated skill market. So the only thing you have left is either character to like a good character that mm. a company thinks is worth investing, which is the mindset, or the grit to survive through. Mm. Because everything is uh, in a cycle, up and down. Mm. So if you have the grit to withstand the cycle, it's very likely you overlap to one of the success points in your life. Um, but that's, that's kind of like my answer so mm. far. Yeah. But the talent pool right now, do you think millennials have that? Um, those who want to get started in this space, do you think that they have those qualities that are needed? And do you see that in the people that you hire right now for 1010 Studio? Um, I think no one has it. it mm. It's not something that you would have, actually. Um, okay. There was a time where, you know, when my parents were growing up, I assume, because that was after um, all the leftovers from the occupation, war, whatever. Mm people would openly go out to tell each other like work is tough life is tough there's a lot of hard work you have to put in a lot of hours you're going to get anything that you want and that's why that generation grew up knowing that that's what they had to do mm. it's just a matter of implanting that early mm. so i think maybe because it's, it's wrong to assume that a generation has something or doesn't have something it's, it's because it's obvious that every generation has nothing Right, because we're all born empty anyway mm. is what you put in so I, I would just say like just people need to talk about it a bit more mm. people need to openly discuss about that you know like yes there's work life balance but there's also work work mm. right and, and nothing comes for free mm. right so but you always have a choice you are not a failure if you don't go a certain path nor are you a real success if you go a certain mm. other path it's just a choice mm. And how, how, what do you want to do with that choice? That's mm -hmm. about it. I think, um, I think there's too much concern about what or who young people are. Because um, I looked into it mm -hmm. and I, I watched. And you can look up even uh, older documentaries about the, like in 1950s, where people are talking about the generation that were the hippie culture, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Everyone was complaining about everyone. Mm. And it sounded like the same complaints. And if the complaints are the same, means like it's not worth complaining anymore. Mm. <laughs> it means like it's something other than that. Okay. Yeah. So, it's just human nature to keep talking about the, the generation that's coming up. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's... Um, to, to even label a generation of a generation mm. doesn't make sense. Okay. Like, you are just a, a... It's a mind. It's a person. Mm. I mean, I've met young people that are way forward thinking mm. and I've met young people that are correct at their thinking within their age mm. and I've met young people that are totally before that mm. and um, what I can only tell them is like you know like this world needs a certain thing mm. for you to be considered successful it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong it's just that if you want that you got to do x y and z mm. and that's about it you shouldn't feel bad to change. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a, a task. Um, you can still do what you want, but you just understand that you're not a lousy person. Right. You're in, and you, you shouldn't use... Because the societal needs are always shifting. Mm -hmm. Societal demands are always shifting. So it's pointless to measure it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you say to people who want to join the creative space? In particular, mm -hmm. being a concept artist like you. Right. Yeah. Is it a tough industry? Is it saturated? What What would your advice be to these people? Um, the 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 one I can think of the most is try to understand 
the entire business as opposed to just the concert art side. The um, whole ecosystem. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, there is a class that I teach that um, concert artists are really good at what to draw. Mm. Um, you know what, like, is it what exactly is on paper? They're really good at that. Um, but they're not really good at who they're drawing it for. Right. Is it for a director? Is it for a cinematographer? Mm. Is it for a 3D artist? Is it for the public audience? They're all different. Like who you draw for, you require a totally different skill set and a totally different mindset of how you project the artwork. Mm. And the other thing is, which is the hardest one, is like why? Why are you drawing this for? Mm. Are you trying to tell a story? Are you trying to show off? Mm. Are you trying to help sell a product? Mm. You know, that, that second two part is a bit mm. trickier. But so when I talk to mature artists or, or young successful artists, they, they seem to get that immediately. They, they mm. know that when they submit an artwork, oh, I drew this for this person, this person. Mm. And instinctively, like they're like that. Maybe when they're in school, they had good upbringing, or whatever, mm. good education. Uh, but usually those are the people that would do better in life. And I think that applies to everything. Like regardless of what service mm. you go into, uh, who is it for and why you're doing it. Mm. Very, very crucial. Yeah. Right. Um, I think this is very common in the creative space. Um, and I think that you're very familiar with it. Mm. How do you deal with rejection? Mm. Not many people are very good at, you know, receiving rejection and facing it. Can yeah. you tell us a, can you tell us a time when you face your first rejection and how you actually grew from that? Because running a business you would definitely have faced a lot of rejection. And like you said, this is non-fiction work. Yeah. How do you actually add value? It's so subjective. You've got to break through so many layers. Different people have different uh, perception about certain things, what's good and what's not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're asking about coping mechanisms. <laughs> <laughs> um. well, how, do you, yeah, how do you deal with it and how do you cope after that? <laughs> uh, that's why I, I think it's very important that you discount yourself from the service that you're providing. Um, mm -hmm. If someone rejects your work, it's like you're, it doesn't mean that you are a bad person per se. Right. It's just that the, the thing that you submitted is not suitable at the moment. That's it. Mm. Yeah. So you're like, when when you provide a solution that a client does not accept, it doesn't mean that your solution is bad. Mm. It's just your solution is inappropriate at the current situation your client is in. Okay. And that's about it it could still very well be a very good solution for another time. Mm. So rather than discounting it altogether, you should just keep it in your back pocket for the next time you can use it. Mm. And that's why I do a lot. Like if there's a design that doesn't work out, mm. I mean, obviously this is easier said than done mm. because any, anything that you work for that you put your heart into, mm. you can't help but be invested in, as we yeah. call it, like sending your babies out, right? And they all come back all beaten and bruised yeah. with, with notes on it. <laughs> like, Emotional attachment. Yes, right? yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, and to, to give, uh, again, like I'm, I guess I'm, uh, what do you call it? Uh, maybe my, my, my mindset is disjointed in, in, mm -hmm. th in that sense. But that's why I say it's, it's very important if as an artist, you, you need to have your stuff and you need mm. to have work stuff. Mm. So my, my metal head is like, whatever you say, I'm not going to deal with it. Mm. Like, this is my product. Mm. You know, this is like my little safe space that I would just keep mm. pursuing. Um, I would absorb the free critique because it's great, but I'll, I'll select. But when it comes to client work, my mindset is just like, I'm not really looking at anything else. I'm just trying to figure out how can I help you? Mm. As a, as a business owner, mm. as a product seller, how can I help you? I, if you think that this change is necessary for you to help sell your product, I'm on board. Mm. I'm happy to make the fix. Mm. But the good thing about it as well is like, because now that I'm really invested in your product, if I disagree, I'm going to disagree in a point like, I'm sorry, but from my experience, when I put this design in, it sells more. Mm. I mean, please think about it. And people love you for that. Yeah, because of that counsel. Yeah, yeah. well, because you're trying to help them su succeed, mm. right? You're, you're, not, you're no longer defending that picture of the picture. Mm. You're, you're trying to help create a bigger ecosystem. Yeah. So I guess if, if the easiest way is just look at the bigger picture. Um, and honestly, concept art is the forgotten section of art. Mm. It should be. It's, it's by design, it should be. Mm. 
we are creating a draft of what is the final product. Mm. The final product is the one that should be celebrated. Mm. Ours is a process of creation. Real like the flour marks on the table after someone has made a cake. Mm. And that's it. If you think that's valuable, that's good. Mm. I think it's valuable. I'm, I'm fine with that. And some, mm. I'm thankful someone decides to put money on that. Mm. Um, but you have to understand that it's a part of the process. Mm. Right? So that's why I'm, I'm not keen on uh, over-aggrandizing any particular part of any occupation. Mm unless you are in a civil service line mm. like nurses soldiers police officers mm. people who actually do real service mm. yeah my my job is literally make stuff more pretty <laughs> <laughs> you know it's that's about it that's all i'm doing for this world mm. um you know so uh it's not wise to mm. over aggrandize it i mean you can enjoy yourself but but don't think of them see yourself too much right. yeah um, which is another thing I realized as I mm. became art director yeah because it starts to get to your head mm. yeah is it more um, is it more fulfilling for you right now running your own studio um, having more time to also focus on your own personal projects as well does it give you more happiness in a sense give you more joy it it gives it gives me fulfillment mm. um uh, like I, I usually say this, uh, uh, happiness to me is, is um, I'm probably sitting somewhere just with a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. Um, like no one disturbed me, just I want to have my alone time. Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or, or something like, like just silly, right? Mm. I, and I don't believe in pursuing happiness. Uh, I, I believe in pursuing fulfillment and responsibility. Um, uh, because it's a little bit more tangible and less fickle uh, because mm. happiness is actually a very simple glimmer and it's better that way but constant happiness is poison I think why is that? because you have nothing to compare it to mm. right yeah. okay yeah because mm. happiness is only nice when you have well, if you, like that's why Friday nights are great because you've hustled the whole week, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean. But if if you're unemployed, where every day is a Friday, yeah. it becomes quite tiring pretty mm-hmm. quick. I so mean, you want to appreciate that uh, yeah. sense of freedom. I want to earn my Friday mm-hmm. essentially, um, uh, which is fulfillment. Like I want to like. I have limited hours in a day, and I do this very morbid thing when I count the hours I have left. <laughs> you know, like the my Chrome browser. There's a very good Chrome edition. I don't. If you're morbid enough, it's very cool. It's called a like a a timer. Okay. Yeah. Essentially, it's a it's a real time clock of your age. So I'm thirty years and X amount of hours and X amount of days and, mm. and minutes and seconds. It's a real time clock. Okay. So it gives you a very really sense that time is moving. Yeah, and so. I like it. I think it's great. Um, I, I've already done the math, you know. Let's say I live up to about... I, I can probably work healthily up to about 65 at best. Okay. Which means like um, I'm 30 now. Mm. And 65, I wouldn't call it optimum working. So let's say I have about... Uh, 30 to 65 is 35 years. Mm. And probably in that 35 years, I only have 10 more years of optimal efficiency and another 15 of give or take managerial stuff mm. you know because your brain deteriorates anyway mm. um, so there's 10 years of solid work 15 years of secondary work a film or a video game takes two and a half years to three years to make mm. i only have 10 years mm-hmm. that's like three films right <laughs> so you put it that way gerald yeah 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 <laughs> and and that reality is important because it allows you to focus on because, like I said, I, when I was young, I, I'm probably very dyslexic or a high-functioning autist. Like, I cannot deal with too much noise. Mm-hmm. Right? It's overwhelming. So when I talk to students, I totally get them that they feel lost. It makes sense. It's a maddening place. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised anyone has direction. So you got to do the math. You got to like break it down into small pieces that you can digest. 
and feed yourself very simple truths mm -hmm. and then you work on it mm -hmm. and that's fulfillment mm -hmm. right so within this 10 years i need to ensure that i have the health capacity mental capacity to help as many people and projects as i possibly can mm -hmm. and that is a very good drive to work 13 14 hours a day this is easy in fact it's i always it's too little time it's still too little it's mm -hmm. like always too little um, and so that's why I say like, the mindset is important mm -hmm. to see the, like what's going on and and this is even a very optimistic calculation mm -hmm. because accidents happen illnesses happen economies happen mm -hmm. right politics happen um, so even my 10 years it could be a, a optimistic es es mm -hmm. estimation okay yeah so cheers to another optimist optimistically speaking cheers to another 10 years of yeah solid 10 work. you see what i did there yeah <laughs> 10 years of solid work <laughs> yeah you, yeah that's why it's like 10 10 <laughs> <laughs> okay so one last advice to people who are looking to join this particular space that you're in mm, one good advice that's not well, the first good advice is there's no such thing as one good advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you need to have an extremely open mind. Mm. Um, the wider that your mind is open, the more stuff can go in. Mm. And after the stuffs mm. go in, now you have a lot of good stuff in your head mm. or bad stuff in your head. Mm. Develop a strong filter. And the filter is you as a person, your values, your virtues, and your goals. So you need an open mind and your definition of values and virtues as a filter to take in whatever you think is right. And nothing is wrong, nor nothing is right. The only thing is what is, just choose what is better or best for you at the moment. Mm -hmm and just keep calibrating those requirements as you mature as a person and then you should be fine mm -hmm. unless you die <laughs> so morbid <laughs> okay and where can people find you on your social handles right so um, I am on my website is geraldson.com it's just my name I am on our station under the same name I'm like the easiest person to find once you get my name because I don't have nicknames. Okay. Um, I like the name my parents gave me. I'm quite proud of it. Um, so you can look up my name, Facebook, Instagram, ArtStation, and my website. My company, 1010 Studio, is 1010 Studio, all alphabets, dot co. Um, that's a place where we're, we're con continuously improving to add on more works with my team. We are based in Banda Sunway. I currently also teach at the One Academy. That's my alma mater. Is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah. I believe in branding. Yeah. <laughs> ten, ten, <six. laughs> yeah. Um, I still teach at the One Academy, uh, where I conduct mm -hmm. classes twice a week. Um, all my students are aspiring concert artists, and I talk to them a lot about their career paths and where they're supposed to go. So, um, if any of you are young persons who want similar answers to them or mentorship, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Never done this with this cup before. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So that's Gerald Sung. Um, interesting conversation with Gerald Sung, the concept artist. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed it putting it out for you. And um, if you would like to know more about Gerald, please feel free to go onto his website, ArtStation, and his social handles. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.